we know that the four pillars when we think about educational success is, I know this to be true because I published them. Uh, <laughs> our families, parents, you know, community, especially peers, but what's happening in the community with our infrastructures. Third will be the institutions that they're involved in, good teaching, good pedagogy, good curriculum, good counselors, good all of those, but better <laughs> than good. Very high level of expectations, rigors, and inputs. And the fourth is the student, him or herself, helping them to understand that they know how to self-evaluate, to have self-efficacy, to argue for what they need. You know, the idea that if we can teach them how to recognize when they don't have something that they need to be successful, and then be able to understand how to go about finding it. This becomes what I think our charge is. So the question that popped up as I was listening to the Lieutenant Governor, and I'm going to ask all three of you, he may have addressed it somewhat more already than, than, than what the question sounds like, but is affordability. When I think about many of our parents with the economic uh, downturn and a variety, but even before that, it's become problematic. Whether we were supported at the level we could be supported at the state level, obviously I argue that uh, that funding has decreased, especially in higher education, significantly. And when you think about the amount of students in K-12, there is a decrease there also. So, gentlemen, talk to me a little bit about how do we make affordability not only a priority, but how do we make it happen? <laughs> um, well, because people don't have to pay to go to K-12, um, sounds like this is really talking about college, uh, and it is. Uh, it, it's an issue that uh, is one that we think about every day, uh, and it is, it, it is complex in this sense. The Lieutenant Governor was just talking about the challenges of funding K-12. Uh, because even though the funding has stayed static, uh, other forces have not. Well, the same is true in higher ed, except the forces, the funding hasn't stayed static, it's actually been declining. Um, uh, we have taken cuts uh, in public higher education, according to President Jim Ramsey at the University of Louisville, 11 times over the last 10 or 12 years. Uh, this past year, a 6.5% cut in our operating budget. Um, but at the same time, uh, our enrollment has grown quite dramatically. Uh, let me, let me uh, I guess, share some real numbers with you. Um, when people talk about affordability of college, what they really mean is the price of college, called tuition. But in fact, if you attend a public university, Tuition is not the cost, it's the price. The actual cost of educating a student is significantly greater than the price, and the difference between the price you pay and the cost has been the state subsidy, the amount of money that the state gives to our public institutions. So the amount of money that is coming to the institutions on a per student basis over the last decade has dropped $4,000 per student. That's a combination of many more students and a lot less money. The price has tried to make up some but not all of that gap in order to preserve uh, both the quality of our educational resources and to address the growing enrollment. Just one example, uh, the most substantial, is KCTCS in the last three years has seen an enrollment growth uh, of, of close to 15,000 students, full-time equivalent students, and they are getting less money than they got three years ago to support those students. This past year, because of the cuts and because of just the cost of health insurance for our workers, unemployment insurance, the cost of energy, which has gone up a little bit, the combination of the cuts and those fixed costs 
have grown across our public universities this past year about $120 million in total. With the tuition increases of 4% uh, at the community colleges, 5% at the comprehensives, and 6% at the two research universities, that only made up about $50 million of that $120 million hole. And so the campuses are looking for ways to fill that gap, and the way they're going to fill the gap for the most part is to cut their costs, which means, as you're seeing at the University of Kentucky, uh, announce layoffs, uh, programs that will have to be reduced in some way, uh, and looking for other efficiencies, which, which they're doing. All of that said, let me come back to price, because that's the thing that matters to the students and the families that you serve. Okay? The good news is that the sticker price, which is what the 4, 5, and 6 percent pertain to, only get paid by about 10 to 15 percent of our students and they are the students with the most financial resources. Because of the existence of the uh, various financial aid programs, both the Pell Grant program at the federal level, the various uh, programs from the Key Scholarship, the CAP and KTG programs here in Kentucky, uh, as well as financial aid that the institutions themselves provide to our students. The actual cost for students uh, attending our institutions, depending on what their income group is, uh, is actually pretty manageable for most families. Now, there are still some, uh, particularly as students get into a third and fourth year of college uh, and maybe have a job uh, that's consuming X number of hours of, of their time, that continuing their college education becomes a real burden for them. But I would hate, hate to have people functioning under the notion because you see headlines from time to time that college is unaffordable. Um, for, uh, and we use, we actually publish a, a graph when we do our tuition uh, announcements in the spring uh, that shows against the cost of tuition, fees, and books. And we have those averages for each of the different sectors. If you're attending um, a comprehensive university in Kentucky and your family income puts you in the lowest 25%, you will receive on average more in aid by about $1,500 than the cost of tuition fees and books. And you say, well, what about room and board? Well, um, that's an expense, no question. But whether you are going to college or going to work, you're going to pay room and board somewhere. And so. Uh, I mean, it's a serious issue, obviously, but it's one that, that frankly, I, I consider something independent of the actual cost of attending college. If you're in the second income quartile, in other words, right up against the midpoint, um, the out-of-pocket cost for those families uh, is measured in hundreds of dollars, a couple hundred dollars, for a full, full year of uh, tuition. If you're in the third income quartile, in other words, you're now income above the, the midpoint, um, uh, it's about $1,500 of out-of-pocket expenses. And if you're in the highest income group, these are families with $130,000, $140,000 of income, uh, their out-of-pocket expense is still around $3,500, $3,600, uh, which in terms of what you're getting, called a college education, seems to me is a pretty good deal. So uh, uh, for the families that you deal with, uh, I think it's really important not to worry about the tuition level per se, but to learn about the amount of financial aid that's available because it is substantial and it can make an enormous difference uh, for these families. I just, I, I recoil when I see the headlines that say uh, some expert somewhere declares college education unaffordable. Uh, when we know with all the assistance that's available, we can make it pretty affordable for most families. So, Either one of you gentlemen want to comment? Great job. We're going to give you one last opportunity to uh, talk to the audience, take a minute or two, and then hopefully we'll have about four or five minutes to get one or two questions in from the audience. But this question, as you all know who's in this room, we have a lot of where the rubber meets the road folk. 
whether it's many of our trio programs, Promise, Promise Neighborhoods, Gear Up, people that's working with parents, with students directly, all focusing on college access, college success, and college readiness. If you could just give me a direction, a positive element for them, a charge to them, if you will, uh, and once again, I, I will say from my vantage point, I know some of the things you're dealing with. You are fighting, in some cases, what you may think is uphill battle. Uh, and I know that you've bought into this battle wholeheartedly and you're ready for the fight. And my statement would be that don't give up, even when it looks like you are not winning it. Dr. Holliday stated fairly clearly that before, when you were getting 70, 80 percent proficient, this coming year with our new Common Core Standards test, Dr. Holliday, maybe 30, 40 percent. Let this be known that that's now the right baseline, and it's not an indicator of how bad we've done. It's an indicator of what we need to do to build where we're at. So let that be my statement to you as a charge. So I'm just going to start with the lieutenant governor and kind of go down the panel. Well, I think what I would leave with you is that you're not alone. And more than ever before, the communities from whence you come, the businesses that want to hire your, employ uh, your, your students ultimately, they get it right now more than ever before. When I graduated Seneca High School, you could sort of disregard the bottom 25% of the high school class because you, uh, you had plenty of jobs, you had enough young people because the boomers were coming out and they could all get jobs and the bottom 25%, you know, whatever happened to them, no one really followed. Right now we need every individual we can get. Uh, you've seen the inverted pyramid that if you haven't, you ought to get Ron Crouch to give you a lecture on where we're going and the boomers are coming and they're turning 65, 10,000 a day starting a year ago, January. Um, and so you're not alone because the businesses understand to be competitive and to stay competitive. They need what you've got, and that's that human resource, and they need them to be skilled and productive, and they need them to be ready to go to, to college or ready to get the certificate uh, that they will ultimately need to keep them successful. So don't ever think that, the that you're by yourself and the community's not engaged. I mean, all you need to do in, in this community here, uh, we had concern about the number of kids that weren't reading at grade level in uh, K through 12. And so we went out and started a program with the business community assisting us and the nonprofit community assisting us and the, and the uh, school system assisting us, Jefferson County Public Schools, and we got 10,000 volunteers to spend a half an hour a week with a child who wasn't reading at, um, at grade level because our assumption was if you don't read well, you, you, you've got significant problems going on after high school. And, and we did that for a four, almost a five-year period. 10,000 people who gave their time for half, they did it at lunchtime, did it on the way to work in the morning, or as the boomers are retiring, they can go in and do it whenever because they've got the flexibility of schedule. And so the next thing you know, we begin to move the, the meter from 14% of, of our 100,000 students here not reading at grade level to, after four years, 7%. And you'll never get it down to zero with... English as a second language and autism and all the other kinds of things that, that we all deal with in our schools around the Commonwealth. So the point is, is that the business community, the nonprofit community, the civic organizations, and your mayors and county judges get it. And they're looking for an opportunity to help. And so as you work through the process and need that kind of support, look at your community, challenge them to be a part of what you're about to ensure that ultimately those graduates have an opportunity to go on to higher education. Um, I'm gonna, I guess, change course a little bit here for me in terms of my earlier remarks. Um, in thinking about the greatest challenge that, that I know you face, uh, and having participated uh, in years past in this program, uh, and I think last year and the year before, meeting with some of the parents and students who participate in the program. I think the biggest challenge is you need to use your skills and your interaction with these students to give them and their families the confidence that they can do this. Time and time again, what I heard from the families um, was we never dreamed three years ago, four years ago, five years ago, when their children first came into the program that our kid could go to college, 
because they didn't go. Or they thought they couldn't afford it. I think in addition to the affordability, so many of these kids don't believe academically they can do the work. So part of the challenge is to get them to believe they can do it, which means you've got to push them and encourage them to take challenging college preparatory level courses, not the easy courses because they'll get 50 more dollars in the key scholarship program because they got an A instead of a B. Have them take the tougher course so that they know and see that they can do the work. Giving them that confidence will be as valuable as probably anything else you do. I, I, I'll close with this. There's this wonderful program we have in Kentucky uh, sponsored by the Exxon Mobil Corporation called Advance Kentucky. And it's a program targeted at many of the same kids you deal with to get them in high school, persuade them to take advanced placement courses, and then to take the AP exams for which they get college credit if they score a three or above. The program has been the subject of some national advertising. And uh, even today, the, the ads are now a little bit different, but uh, they're all about encouraging kids uh, and encouraging teachers and those of us in education to expect more uh, from our students and to encourage them uh, with higher expectations. Anyways, on one of the ads, they had a teacher who happened to be one of our Kentucky teachers in the program, and she closes the advertisement with this line, which I thought was so beautiful. She said, I know they can even when they think they can't. I think if you embrace that philosophy and apply that to the youngsters you're going to be working with, uh, we'll have great success. My comment would be that the um, eyes of the nation are on Kentucky. Uh, not because of the Hatfield and McCoy's uh, recent <laughs> series, even though that's a great series, and I've learned an awful lot about uh, uh, you know turn of the century. But uh, the eyes of the nation uh, are definitely on Kentucky because of what we're doing for our future here with college and uh, career readiness. So I, I think uh, you, you should feel empowered. You should feel tired, sure, but you should feel excited because I've traveled um, all over Kentucky. I've been in uh, 140 school districts on my way to 174 this year, over 400 schools. I've been to Paducah to Pikeville. I've been to Murray to Ashland. I've been to Boone to uh, Logan County. I've been east, west, north, and south. And what I find is what uh, Lieutenant Governor mentioned is every community is committed to their children and every part of every community is ready to join you in this work to make sure the eyes of the nation are focused on Kentucky and the great work we're doing. So um, get rested a little bit this summer because there's room, room, we're going to really get going uh, come the fall, all right? But you're going you're to do great. You're going to do terrific. Uh, we have three minutes. I have time for one question. I'm telling three minutes to these very articulate gentlemen so they'll know. Uh, any uh, burning question you would like to pose, anyone? You must answer all the questions. Well, then I'll take up the three minutes. Uh, <laughs> Please ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> you left the opening. Uh, two or three points I want to make as a closing. One of the things that we know in post-secondary, and I know that they know in the governor's office, also in the legislature, and also in P-12 and Terry's office, that our greatest resources are our children. As we, I'm one of those baby boomers, uh, as many of us move on to other things, we're probably going to die of a heart attack for being a workaholic first by, before we move on. But, <laughs> When we move on, we want to make sure that what we have here are people that can come in behind us and do a better job. It's our confidence in what we've started with college and career readiness and what you're doing out in the field that that will happen. So even though whatever you're doing at whatever level you're doing it, you have to understand there is a direct causal 
process that leads to something much larger. I had a young man, I'll leave you with a story. I had a young man, I was at the bank one day at the teller machine in Richmond. Somebody pulled up in a car, it was a very nice car, and he was looking at me and I'm getting money out of the machine. I said, well, not, that actually may be mugged in the nicest car I've ever seen. But uh, when I came out of the little door at the teller machine and this young man walked up and he said, he said, Dr. Thompson, I know you don't remember me, he said, but I had you in class 20 years ago. And he said, I was in your class and he said, I was ready to drop out. He said, I figured out I had been in school for over a year and college just wasn't for me. It just wasn't hitting me as being important. There was nothing that I felt like I had been heard. I had parents back home telling me I should come back home. And I was ready, he said, I had decided before coming in your class and this was the first week at school. He said, I decided before coming in your class that I was going to just go home. I wasn't going to start this semester. And he said, I remember you said something to me. Of course, I remember what I said. <laughs> no, I really don't. He said, you said that, he said, your father told you there's two things worth fighting for. And that's your family and that's education. And he said, my father told me this, he said, so you go out and do all you can do in every which way you can to take care of both. And he said, you said that to me, and he said, I stayed in school, and this young man now is the associate pastor of the largest church <coughs> in Texas. The point being is that what you do is important. What you do at whatever level you do it is important. Just like kids will hear whatever their parents are saying, whether they think they're saying it loud enough or not, they're hearing it. So whatever you say and whatever you do, make sure the kids know that it's a supportive statement of them achieving what they need to achieve. It was great talking to you, gentlemen. It was great having you on the panel. What knowledge, what good state leadership. Thank you all very much. Be back here in 15 minutes for the second panel.